So I want to read James chapter 1, verse 1 today, and if you have your Bibles, please follow along. This is what it says. James, a servant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ, to the twelve tribes in the dispersion, greetings. Now I know that few sermons are based solely upon one verse, and even fewer of those sermons are based on the greetings of these New Testament letters. But I think that this, just focusing here, answering a few of the questions that come up, will allow us to to get some fundamental understanding of where we're going in this letter. It will help us to have boundaries in terms of where and how we want to understand what is being written here. That we don't just take it and say, well, it means this to me, but what does it mean for those original readers, and what does it mean for God's church today as well? And so what I want to do is is answer some of the questions that arise so that we can clearly catch the meaning and the magnitude of the message of James. Now this verse that we read includes the standard details of any letter written in those days. You'll, You'll notice by looking at it, it begins with who is sending the letter, and then it states who it's for, and then they have a greeting which simply is greetings. You can look at that verse and it's easy to find out where those elements are. But what's not so simple is actually understanding who it was written by and who it was written for. We have to look a little bit deeper into this. And so what I intend to do this morning is, uh, is to use any forensic shows that you've seen or Sherlock Holmes or, or whatever sort of shows like that that you've been able to, to, to investigate things. We need to look at this verse to understand what it is, who it is that we're even talking about in the first place. And so what we're going to do is we're going to ask questions like the fact that there are about, I think there's five people in the, in the New Testament that are called James. So which James is it that calls themselves a slave of God and wrote this letter? In other letters, we see that Paul identifies the people that he wrote to, like the Galatians or the Corinthians, based on the city that they were living in. But here, where is the dispersion? And the 12 tribes, who are they talking about with that? Who are the 12 tribes? Because the 12 tribes were scattered. They were dispersed in the Old Testament after King David's reign and were no longer the 12 tribes anymore. And so we need to answer some of these questions. And by digging into these, I think in this one verse, we've got ourselves a sermon. And so if, you, if you've seen any of those investigative shows, I need you to, to bring along and to use whatever investigative skills that you have to dig into these, these questions. All we really have to go on here is the first name of the author. That's all he gives us. And in some ways, we might assume which James we're talking about, but we really need to ask the question and figure out who it really is. And even though it seems like it'd be a dead end to think, well, it says James. We have no last name. We have nothing else. It's actually a clue into who it is that wrote this book. In Mark chapter 3, we learn that one of the apostles, it says, was named James, and he was the son of Alphaeus. We don't know much more about him, but we know that he was one of the apostles. That's a James in the New Testament. Another apostle was Judas, not Iscariot, but in Luke chapter 6, it was Judas, and it's identified as the son of James. So that's another James, but we really don't know much about that one either. One of the women at the tomb was named Mary. It says, the mother of James in Mark chapter 16. But all three of these Jameses don't rise to the popularity and significance of two other James in the New Testament. And I think for that reason, because we don't know much more about them, we don't know their involvement in the the future of the church, that I don't think that it's them that wrote this book. So which James could it be? Which one could say it's James and everybody knows who they're talking about? Well, one of the two most prominent Jameses in the New Testament you probably have thought of. It's the apostle. He was in Jesus' inner circle. It was Peter, James, and John that were always there. He was called by Jesus to follow him when he was fishing. He saw Jesus at his transfiguration. He, he was involved in watching Jesus while he prayed in Gethsemane. And so all of these, the son of Zebedee, this James, often connected with his brother John, is probably the most popular one that we know of. And you'd think that because John also wrote the Gospel of John and other New Testament books, that this James might be the preferred author for this letter uh, in, because of this thing. But it's actually unlikely that that's the case, and I'll explain why. So what James haven't we thought of? 
What James haven't we considered to be the one who wrote this letter who would be that significant to write divine revelation and just sign it, James? And that would be none other than Jesus' own brother. Contrary to the Catholic belief that Mary remained a virgin for her entire life, we actually learn that Mary had other sons and daughters as well. And the first time we, we, we hear about this is in Mark chapter 3, but it's not a glowing report. In Mark chapter 3, it says this, When Jesus' family heard it, and this is right after he's claiming to be God, the Son of God, the Messiah, he's preaching the kingdom of God, he's claiming all of these things. When Jesus' family heard it, they went out to seize him, for they were saying he is out of his mind. And because of this, we see it in verse 31 of that same chapter, his mother and his brothers came. And we're to imagine that James was one of them. He was among them at that time. And then later on, he's in his hometown of Nazareth, and no one is believing him. He's dishonored in his hometown, and one of the things that they said was this. Is not this the carpenter, speaking of Jesus, the son of Mary and brother of James and Joseph and Judas and Simon? Are not his sisters here with us? And so it would seem that Jesus shared the same mother with at least six siblings. And so even at this point, whether, whether it's true that James might have been even the oldest of all of his siblings, because he's the first one mentioned here, regardless of that, whether that is true, James is one of these brothers of Jesus. And they didn't believe in him. They didn't believe that their brother or their son, well, their brothers, was the son of God. They didn't believe that. And in fact, you'd think that if you were to try to convince your own family, that would be harder than your friends and other people, wouldn't it? And so his family didn't believe in him. And in John chapter 7, it records of a feast that the Jews were heading up to Jerusalem to go to. And this is what his brothers said to him. They said, leave here and go to Judea that your disciples also may see the works that you are doing. They wanted him to go. They wanted him to perform these works. And the reason why is because they wanted the fame of being the miracle worker's brother. Because it says two verses later, for not even his brothers believed in him. So James doesn't believe in Jesus immediately. And in fact, it, it's possible that James still didn't believe when Jesus is hanging on the cross. Otherwise, why did Jesus put his mother, Mary, into the care of the apostle, John? It says in John chapter 19, when Jesus saw his mother and the disciple whom he loved, that's John, standing nearby, he said to his mother, woman, behold your son. Then he said to the disciple, behold your mother. And from that hour, the disciple took her to his own home. And so we're not really sure when James, the brother of Jesus, became a Christian, that he actually had faith in Christ and saw him as the Messiah and his master. But interestingly, when, when Paul rehearses the, the death of Jesus, the burial of Jesus, and the resurrection of Jesus, he says this, that Jesus appeared to James, then to all the apostles. And so James is apparently well known in, uh, to the Corinthians. He, he has come to be significant enough that, again, here, there's no last name, there's no extras, they're supposed to know who James is. And it seems that Jesus deliberately showed himself to James. And the other thing it seems is that he showed himself to James before all of the other apostles. So because he's not lumped in with the apostles, he's probably not James the apostle, but James, this James has become so popular that he can just refer to him by his first name and everybody knows who he's talking about. So by now this half brother of Jesus had come to faith in Christ at that point and he was as popular as the apostles themse themselves. But the question is, how did this happen? Where do we see this taking place in the New Testament? Well, you know that the book of Acts records the development of the early church and, and how after the ascension of Christ, it began to grow and how, how things happened. And we know that there was roughly 120 people and that increased by 3,000 on the day that Jesus sends the Holy Spirit and Peter preaches at Pentecost. Soon after that, 5,000 believed all at one time. And so you see the growth of the church, which would have been amazing to be a part of. And the question is, as this church was developing, it was predominantly Jewish, and the headquarters of the church were in Jerusalem. And while the apostles would have devoted themselves to the word and prayer, 
there were other people that had come to faith that began to emerge as leaders in the church. And so we learn of new names like Matthias and Stephen and Barnabas. And you remember that Stephen told a speech in the Sanhedrin. He confessed Jesus as the Christ, and he became the first Christian martyr. And at that moment, it says in Acts chapter 8, that Saul approved of his execution. Now look what happens to everyone. And there arose on that day a great persecution against the church in Jerusalem. And they were all scattered throughout the regions of Judea and Samaria, except the apostles. And so this scattering of Christians left, made them all leave Jerusalem, and everywhere they went, it actually became the occasion in which evangelism and the gospel spread. Look at three verses later. It says, Now those who were scattered, it continues to call them the scattered people, they went about preaching the word. And so expanding from Jerusalem, the church begins to grow, and all of Palestine is hearing the good news of salvation through faith in Jesus Christ. And then later on, it says something interesting. Now those who were scattered, there's that words again, scattered because of the persecution that arose over Stephen, they traveled as far as Phoenicia and Cyprus and Antioch, speaking the word to no one except Jews. Now that's interesting, that the church continued to remain quite Jewish. And so the headquarters of the church remained in Jerusalem. And then in chapter 12, we see where James begins to unfold. Actually, both the Apostle James and James, the Lord's brother, are both mentioned in Acts chapter 12. It says that there's one reason here why the Apostle wasn't the one who wrote this letter. I read it. Because about that time, Herod the king laid violent hands on some who belonged to the church. So persecution continues. And it says that he killed James, the brother of John, with the sword... And when he saw that it pleased the Jews, he proceeded to arrest Peter. So there's James the Apostle. He is now dead by the persecution and by King Herod. Peter is now in prison. And when Peter escapes prison with the help of an angel, look at what he says to do. He, sells, he tells people, he says, tell these things to James and to the brothers. And I think by, by calling him James and not including him with the brothers, it's not the Apostle. The apostle is now dead, and James is also highlighted to a point where he is among the rest of them, with the brothers, the apostles, that he wanted them to tell. And so he's important here. He clearly has authority. And then other things are going on at the same time. While Saul, the, the most intense persecutor of the church, is converted, he comes to faith by seeing the ascended Christ. He is sent out, it says, to preach among the Gentiles. They weren't being preached to. All the Jews that are going out were preaching to other Jews, still thinking that this was a Jewish thing, and yet Paul now is preaching to the Gentiles. And you're going to see some issues begin to form. And so it's through his preaching, this is Paul still, through his preaching and his missionary journeys, the church began to look a lot more Gentile. And all of this matters in how we see James. Paul was a, pra pa a passionate preacher to the Gentiles, and, and James was a pious pillar in Jerusalem. Even Paul himself says in a list, puts James first and says that James and Peter and John seem to be pillars. So Paul meets them and he says, these guys are the big guys. These guys are the elders, like the chief elders at this church in Jerusalem. So James is up there. And James clearly had authority. And later in Galatians chapter 2, it even says that when Jews came from Jerusalem, they even said that they came from James, as if James was the head of the church in Jerusalem. So this brother of Jesus, who we often don't think about, is, is, is a hero of faith. And we see him emerging as the leader, almost the head leader of the church in Jerusalem. But as Paul is preaching and Gentiles begin to be saved, there's this division that begins to happen between the Jews and the Gentiles, that there's this ethnic division. And so what they do is because they haven't run into this issue before, the Jews seek to live holy lives. They knew the Old Testament, and they said, we need to live according to the Old Testament in light of what Jesus has done. But the Gentiles didn't have the Old Testament. They didn't grow up knowing it, studying it, learning it, memorizing it. And they wanted to live holy lives in this godless culture, but not necessarily directly tied to the Old Testament. So this is what they were fighting over or disagreeing on. 
What laws do they have to agree with? What laws do the Gentiles have to begin to, to follow? So they called a council to address this issue. And in Acts chapter 15, it describes it like this. It says, Paul and Barnabas and some of the others, and these are the people from Antioch, so they're outside of Jerusalem in Gentile territory, they are sent, were appointed to go up to Jerusalem to the apostles and the elders about this question. And that chapter, it said that they discussed this. They debated it for a long time. And then it says that Peter spoke up and he said his piece. Then Barnabas and Saul both shared. But I want you to see who brought this whole thing to a conclusion. It, it was a resolution and it was in Acts chapter 15. It says, after they finished speaking, James replied. And he says, brothers, listen to me. And he talks about how, how there are differences and how they should write a letter sending it to, with Paul to tell all the Gentiles what is required of them from the Old Testament, what is actually required for Gentiles who come to faith. And if you'll notice that, that this James is the one involved in this, and you take that copy of that letter, which is in Acts 15, it, it, it outlines it, and then you compare it to James, the letter that we're looking at now, there are phrases and words and lines that are actually quite similar. And the question I would ask then is, which James had a hand in writing the council letter as well as writing this New Testament letter as well? So there's proof, there's evidence that might suggest that this is truly the author of James. And all the way through the book of Acts, as we continue to go through, James continues to be this pillar in Jerusalem. That even Paul... Paul seems to eclipse everyone in honor and fame, all of the other apostles. And as he's going out, and even though he's that popular and that authoritative, when he comes to Jerusalem on his third missionary journey, it says that he wanted and, and did report to James. And he wanted to tell him all that had gone on through God among the Gentiles. Even Jude. Jude begins his letter in the same way as James. It says, Jude, a servant of Jesus Christ. There's that, that phrase again. And then he calls himself, and the brother of James. So this James is actually a lot more in the New Testament than we often remember or think. He is a, probably one of those heroes of faith that we often forget. And perhaps that's often what heroes of faith are, are, have happened to them. And I think all of these things believe, or makes me believe that it supports the idea that James, the brother of Jesus, actually wrote this letter. Who else named James, out of all these ones that we looked at, could write a letter and just write James? And everyone knew who he was talking about or who it was from. But I want you to get, more importantly, an idea of how he sees himself, about what his character is like. This is the James that we're talking about, and yet it says he calls himself a servant of God, in verse 1, and of the Lord Jesus Christ. He refers to himself as a servant, as a slave. I mean, why didn't this James claim the, the honor to say, I'm Jesus' brother, when he could have? Why didn't he claim the authority of saying, I'm the leader of the church in Jerusalem? And yet when he writes this letter, he says, I am a slave of God and of Christ. Like the rest of us, he began as a skeptic of Jesus. But when God gave him the gift of faith, and opened his eyes to see who Jesus really is, to see that he is the Son of God and the Savior of the world, it's then, in that moment, that James realizes that Jesus is his only hope in life and death. Jesus is the one, not just his brother by blood, but the, the Savior of the world and divine, the Son of God. And in the same way, James is modeling for us how we are to see Jesus as well. Don't, don't think about him so much as, as in earthly uh, proximity, that he was that close. I grew up with Jesus. I shared a room with Jesus. We had bunk beds. He doesn't, he doesn't talk about anything like that. He says, I am a slave. I am a servant of Jesus Christ. I belong to him. In our adoption as believers, when we put our faith in Christ for who he is and what he has done to save us from our sins through his life and death, we know that he is our only hope that he is our Savior, that he is our, as James says, our Lord and the Christ. He calls him his master, and he calls him the Messiah. And in this way, we see that we are slaves of Christ. 
because of the great mercy, the great love, the great grace that we have received as, as believers from God makes us, yes, joyful in experiencing our adoption of the King of the universe, but even still, as His children, we commit ourselves to serving Him with our entire existence. That's what it means to be a slave of someone. You're owned. You're their property. And in this case, we are God's. We belong to Him. And we see this in the life of James. It's not recorded in the Bible, but it is recorded in history that after he was arrested at one point for his commitment to Christ as, as the Messiah, he was thrown off the temple and he didn't die. So they proceeded to stone him and he didn't die. And so they beat him to death until they were sure. As a slave, he dies because he is owned by God and in this way, as we see in his letter, two times he directly speaks of Christ, and both times he calls him the Lord Jesus Christ. That's who James sees Christ to be. He believed that Jesus was the Master and the Messiah, and as he writes this letter, he's going to want us and anyone who reads it to do exactly the same thing as him, to submit themselves to Christ. James was very familiar with the teachings of Jesus as he probably heard them more than he wanted to early on. But he lived out what Jesus said in Mark chapter 10. Whoever would be great among you must be your servant, and whoever would be first among you must be slave of all. And so we understand that the hierarchy of believers, the, the more important perhaps, the, the more authoritative, it's actually more like a lowerarchy in that we are all slaves of Christ. And the greatest among us is the one that is the slave of all. And so I ask, does, does serving Jesus define your life? Because as we go through this letter, that's what James is going to ask you. And he's not just going to ask you a yes or a no. He's going to demand from you living proof. But verse 1 also describes another section here, who this letter is written to. So we, know, we now understand better who this person is who's writing, but who is he writing to? And we have before us this, this idea, the 12 tribes in the dispersion. We have another ambiguous expression that we need to investigate. Who could this be? And what I think is, is good to do is to look through the letter to see where these things are coming up. How does he talk about them? Who might they be? And does it fit with what we think? And then I want to look at the specific terms. And basically the letter speaks of trials and temptations, lots of them, all kinds of them, and especially in relation to being poor, to poverty. And so it seems like the people that James is writing to have been experiencing trials and have gone through a lot of difficulties. And just like us, if we were to go through the same things, if we were struggling with poverty, if we were going through trials and hardships and difficult things in life, which we do, the same thing would happen to us. And it seems as though they have lost their joy in life. It's, it's been sapped from them. And they're not living according to God's wisdom. They're living according to the world's wisdom and trying to figure out life and get out of their problems by doing it the way that the world would suggest. And another thing they're doing is fighting. They're fighting over everything. Everything has become an occasion to quarrel and fight and, 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 and come at each other in that way. And so these are the problems that they're dealing with. Now, if we were to find out where they were, it says that they're in the dispersion. And the dispersion isn't a, a specific place. It's not immediately obvious to us where they are. But we have already seen in Acts, when the persecution arose, they were dispersed. That word scattered came up again and again and again. And so they not, they're not still in Jerusalem. They've been scattered outside of Jerusalem. It says the believers were all scattered. And over and over again, it refers to them as the scattered ones. These are the Jewish Christians that were dispersed out of Jerusalem. And we learn that this dispersion left the majority of them poor because they fled so hastily from Jerusalem, carrying only what they could carry on their backs, their children. Whatever it was, they left town. They lost their jobs, their homes, their, their, their families were split up. It was, they became believers Jewish believers became refugees. And so they're struggling to make ends meet. They're struggling to live and survive in the Roman Empire in ways that they couldn't 
uh, because they didn't have the resources. And so in verse 1, he calls them the 12 tribes. And I think these 12 tribes and the dispersion are very much connected. We obviously give or think of it as a reference to the 12 tribes of Israel in, in that nation in the Old Testament. And after the the reign of King David, those tribes divided, and Israel became ten tribes. Judah became two tribes. And over time, as they lived with different kings, and and God sent them into exile, the the Assyrians took away the ten tribes. They defeated them, took them into captivity. And then the Babylonians came and took the other two tribes. And so there really wasn't any tribes left. And the people of God were scattered outside of the land that God had promised to them. We know the promised land included Jerusalem, and because God had given this eternal promise, the nation of Israel was thinking, well, we, we're going to get it back. God has got to be got to fulfill His promise to us. But as time went on, they began to doubt that God would ever do this. And the prophets, they come along and they start painting pictures of, of God regathering and renewing the tribes and bringing them back into the land. For an example, Isaiah 49 speaks of raising up the tribes of Jacob. So there's the tribes. They're they're kind of already obliterated. And yet there's these tribes and bringing back the preserved of Israel. Where? Assuming to the land, to the promised land. And so even though they're dispersed, God still sees them as 12 complete tribes. And then there's this promise that that he has given to the people that he would bring them back to the land. And so with this idea, I think James is picking this up and saying, yes, you are dispersed. You are outside of Jerusalem now. You are in the dispersion. Everywhere else beyond the land was considered the dispersion. And so now he's saying, James is saying, that you are not at home, but one day God will bring you back. You are the people of God, the 12 tribes. And even though you are dispersed, God is going to bring you back. And whatever, whatever you're going through now, there is hope. There is life. There is a promise that that God will be faithful to. And so he's encouraging them by calling them these things and referring to it in the dispersion. And so believers today, like, like you and me, who are far from our heavenly home that God has promised to give us through Christ, we know that we have this hope in God that we would one day be in heaven with Him. And right now we are dispersed. His people are dispersed all over the world. We are still His people And we can live with hope that one day He is coming to return, to regather, to renew, and reestablish us in our heavenly home. And so what James is going to call us to do is to be steadfast in our our lives, to remain faithful to God. In James chapter 1, it says, Blessed is the man who remains steadfast under trial. For when he has stood the test, he will receive the crown of life which God has promised to those who love him. So that's what he's referring to. That's what he's saying. It is tough. There are trials. Stay steadfast. Remain faithful. And so the question is, even though we are not home yet, our deliverer has not forgotten us. He is not far, but believers are not home yet. And so James wants to teach us how to live wisely in the world before our king comes to take us home for eternity with him. And and it sounds a lot like Jesus. He's going to give us commands that sound like we need to be perfect as our Heavenly Father is perfect. That's what Jesus said. James is going to call us to do very similar things. And it's a reminder that we can't do this without God's help through faith. So the question, another question is, does obedience, does faithfulness to God in our lives while we are in the dispersion waiting for Him to come for us again? Is is obedience and faithfulness what define our lives? Because as we go through this letter, James isn't just going to ask us yes or no. He is going to demand living proof. So as as we read this, as we spend the next months looking over this letter, we are to relate to both of these things, that we are, as believers, slaves of Christ. And we are not home yet. But in the meantime, These believers that he's writing to have basically lost everything except for their faith. And James is going to talk about their trials. He's going to talk about all of the things that they're experiencing and saying, there is no reason for you to abandon your faith. In fact, it's your faith in God that will bring you divine joy, that will give you divine wisdom. 
And that will give you a divine perspective for you to endure what it is that God has called you and placed you to be in. And with that, we see that faith is the catalyst for obedience in this world. And that our saving faith, the fact that we are saved, is not just a ticket to heaven that we say, okay, it's good, now we just endure till the end and try to get through this. But he's going to say that your saving faith is actually the thing that produces the obedience that God requires of you to remain faithful until the end. So James is going to tell us things. He's going to say, be doers of the word, not hearers only. You've probably heard that before. Be doers. Don't just hear the word. Don't just know it well, but do it. He's also going to say that faith by itself, if it does not have works, is dead faith. And he's not afraid to say that we are to be commanded to do the most obedient things, all the things that God has called us to do. No matter how hard it gets, no matter how poor you are, no matter the difficulty, whatever it is, he's still going to say you need to be obedient. And he's going to say that the only way to do that is through your faith in God. And in the end, he's going to say something that sounds controversial. He's going to say that a person is justified by works and not by faith alone. So church, as, as much as we delight in, in filling our minds with biblical beliefs, and that's a good thing, if those beliefs don't impact our hands and our feet and our tongues and our prayers and our suffering and our planning, everything, then James is going to say, maybe your faith is dead. Maybe you're just deceiving yourselves. And that's the challenge of this letter that all of us need to face individually and for us as a church, that if you claim to have saving faith, then you must have living proof. And so may God teach us and rebuke us and correct us and train us in righteousness so that we may be fully equipped for every good work that he has prepared in advance for us, his slaves, to do until he returns to take us home. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you. Thank you that you've saved us by your grace. Thank you that it's by faith, not by works, that we are justified, but also that that same faith leads us. It produces obedience in our lives. That you call us not just to have faith, but to be faithful to you no matter what we go through, and that the very gift of faith from you has not only helped us see who Jesus is, but allows us helps us, gives us the power to be faithful. And I pray that as we read through your word in this letter from James, that we would be reminded again of the truth that it is that there are works that are to be done, that you require, that you look for in our lives, and that they can only be done by the saving faith that we already have in Christ. And I pray that you would challenge us in ways that would lead us towards you, not away from you, that we would want to obey, want to do these things, no matter how difficult life gets, whatever trials we go through, and I pray that our lives would begin to show the living proof of what we proclaim to the world. And may we as a church grow in this together as individuals and as a corporate body of believers. Would we serve? Would we love? would Would we be obedient and encourage one another to do the same? We thank you for your word. We thank you that you speak to us through it. I pray that by your Holy Spirit, you would continue to do so even beyond this service. So we ask this in Jesus' name, amen.